A very good afternoon, uh, Your Ladyship, Right Honourable Just Chief Justice, distinguished lecturer, Professor Dr. Dieter Grimm, Dean Johan, and Tunku Sophia, the founder of Tun Sofian Foundation, and Tan Sri Arif Yusuf sitting beside me. A very good afternoon to ladies and gentlemen and legal judicial legal fraternity who has tuned in to this special event of the 12th Tun Sofian Memorial Lecture to honor a great jurist and a son of Malaysia and also the alumnus of the Middle Temple Malaysia. This afternoon, we are privileged to share the platform with the Faculty of Law, University of Malaya, who is celebrating their 50th golden anniversary jubilee for an event like this, launching this year as our 50th year. For some of us, for Tunku Sofia and Arif, there are sweet memories of University of Malaya, both of us for me as a student and as a colleague, and of course for both of them, they are colleagues in the teaching fraternity. This afternoon, our proceedings is honored by an opening address to be made by Yang Mulia, the founder of Tun Sofian Foundation, Tunku Sofia Jewa. I will now hand the proceedings to her to give her opening address. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum and salam sejahtera. Dato Sri Shahdaw, Chairman of the Tun Sofian Foundation, Tun Tunku Maimun, Chief Justice of Malaysia, Associate Professor Dato Dr. Johan Shamsuddin, Dean of the Faculty of Law, University of Malaya, Tan Sri Muhammad Arif Yusof, trustee of the Tun Sofian Foundation, formerly Speaker of Parliament of Malaysia and retired Court of Appeal Judge. Professor Dr. Dieter Grimm, distinguished jurist and retired constitutional judge of the Federal Republic of Germany. Members of the judicial legal fraternity, honored participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is a distinct honor for me as founder and trustee of the Tun Sofian Foundation to invite esteemed Professor Dr. Dieter Grimm as our special guest to share his reflections as a retired constitutional judge from the Republic of Germany. We are most delighted to have chosen the Golden Jubilee celebration of the founding of the Faculty of Law, University of Malaya, as an appropriate occasion to hold this event. The Tun Sofian public and later memorial lectures were started in Tun Sofian's own lifetime when a number of newly emerging democracies in Europe were pinning their best hopes on constitutionalism as the preferred model of development. Tun Sofian left us in the closing year of the last millennium, leaving behind the legacy of the lecture series, which started in 1989. The Tun Sofian Foundation that was established posthumously <clears throat> decided to continue the initiative as a memorial lecture series organized in honor of Tun Sofian's outstanding contributions as Malaysia's most 
distinguished juries and authority on constitutional law. And in respect of his earnest commitment and devotion to the rule of law. Today, we are most pleased to honor the high ideals that he stood for by having here with us a towering jurist of light stature and vision to deliver this webinar address. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, as we navigate further into the 21st century, we find ourselves in the middle of uncharted seas, and we look to the higher ideals of constitutionalism to guide us through the millennial challenges of the time. Many of the constitutional challenges in Malaysia have been carried over from the contradictions of the past. They involve conflict between federal and state authorities, feudal interface with the concept of constitutional monarchy, the blurring of jurisdiction between civil and Sharia laws, and between fundamental rights and affirmative action policies. The choice between secularism and religion and between integration and assimilation remain subjects of political debate to this very day. Professor Dieter, in his constitutional wisdom, is well acquainted with legal remedies to seeming contradictions in law. He has spoken about the use of legal principles and doctrines to good effect in solving social and political discontents in society. However, the nuanced approach that has been used by the constitutional courts can only be effective if political and moral absolutists in today's society can be convinced to have a little more patience for shades of gray and take the larger interest of society as a whole. All said and done, whatever the constitutional remedy may be, there is a clear need for visionary and benevolent leadership. A leadership that can help restore the spirit of solidarity and bright optimism of the earlier years. Malaysia, like many other countries, has experience in the words of Tan Sri Mobin Shepherd, the golden years of independence, or what our distinguished speaker today would prefer to term as the heroic era. My own experience here is to the era of Tunku Abdul Rahman Putra as founding father of our nation, of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru as leader of India and the non-aligned movement, and Nelson Mandela as the guiding light of South Africa in the post-apartheid era. The idealism of the early years has given way to executive dominance over constitutional supremacy. 
It is a concern that is best reflected in the words of Dun Sofian. And I quote, the content of a constitution are important, but more important is the spirit of the man at the top, whose duty is to carry out its provision. Do they believe in the system? Were they honest when they swore to uphold the constitution and uphold the rule of law? Do they believe in the independence of the judiciary and the value of a strong bar, incorruptible and fearless? If they do, then the constitution is viable and there is hope and a future for countries. But if they are rogues or charlatans determined only to satisfy their own personal and family ambitions, regardless of the wider interests of the nation, then the country will head towards the abyss, no matter how long and hard its founding fathers labored to write the most nearly perfect constitution in the world. And of course, all said and done, we need to explore better ways and means of educating the minds of our younger generation in order for the spirit of democracy and constitutionalism to survive. Needless to say, we can have the best constitutional laws in the world, but they can have no lasting value or meaning unless they are firmly anchored and rooted in the minds and consciousness of the people. In other words, for constitutionalism to succeed, we need constitutional culture as an important component of the spirit of patriotism or regional solidarity. In this context, I am impressed that Professor Dieter has gone out of his way to investigate why history books in Germany have failed to mention decisions of the Constitutional Court that have deeply impacted on the life of the nation. Change is the order of the universe and the question of relevance of constitutionalism is bound to arise at some point in the future. Constitutional, constitutional law cannot continue for long to remain stagnant in its own wisdom. It is imperative, therefore, for the faculty of law at the University of Malaya to bring the study of constitutional law to bear on the epochal and evolving needs of the times we are living in today. It is a thought for the faculty to consider on the golden anniversary of the, its founding, and there are few as eminently qualified as Professor Dr. Dieter Grimm to discuss the future of constitutionalism on account of his insights into the European experience. 
as it stands, the need for harmonious coexistence within the European Union has already raised concern about the need to subordinate imagined interests of the nation for congruence of values among member countries. While our discourse is still focused on the uneasy interface between democracy and executive dominance, some of the latest developments in Europe may well offer fresh insights into possible scenarios for the future of constitutionalism in our part of the world. I have no doubt in my mind that the judicial legal fraternity in Malaysia and the region as a whole will stand to benefit from the reflections and insights of Professor Dr. Dieter Grimm at this webinar presentation. Last but not least, allow me to once again thank Professor Dr. Dieter Grimm for accepting to share his first-hand knowledge of constitutionalism in his capacity as an experienced jurist, constitutional judge, and public intellectual who continues to have his finger on the pulse of a world that is undergoing rapid transformation. I am also grateful to Mr. Philip Cole, a young professor of law at the Faculty of Law, University of Malaya, for his initiative in getting the foundation interested in organizing this talk today. To the Malaysia Middle Temple Association, Al Alumni Association, and the Asia Europe Institute, University of Malaya, Please accept our deepest appreciation for lending your distinguished names to this event. I am sure that your support and participation have generated interest for this event. To all the participants, please don't miss the opportunity to clarify important issues with our eminent speaker at the end of the talk. Thank you. So humbling, your wise words, Yamulia Tunku Sophia, your incisive summing up of the convergence of what we try to do this afternoon is chastening and humbling the task before all of us as citizens of the world concerned with the community's well. Aaron courtism to the constitutional legal order of party will find its harmony, unity, justice, and with that remark, I now welcome our beloved Dean Johan to give us his welcoming address. Over to you, Dean Johan. Um. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Professor Ko, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Very good evening um, to the Right Honourable Chief Justice of Malaysia, Tun Tengku Maimun, Tengku Tuan Mat, Yang Teramak Mulia, Tengku Datuk Sofian Jewa, founder and trustee of the Tun Sofian Foundation, Yang Bagi Tan Sri Muhammad Ari Yusof, our esteemed and learned speaker, Professor Dr. Dieter Grimm, and respected members of the Judicial Legal Fraternity, Academia, and the general public, ladies and gentlemen. This public check is a momentous and significant, significant one for several reasons for the Faculty of Law University of Malaya. Firstly, it marks the celebration of 50 years of its formation, producing countless legal professionals, luminaries, and leaders of whom many of them are present here today. The faculty, as the oldest established law school in the country, has risen to be a premier law school in the region, contributing to advanced legal scholarship and the development of the law. 
Secondly, the Tons of End Foundation, which was set up to further the aspirations of our illustrious former Lord President and constitutional law icon, Tun Sofian, has joined up with us today in the public lecture, marking also many years of collaboration, furthering the cause of education and constitutionalism. Thirdly, this Golden Jubilee public lecture is officiated by one of our alumna who we, most, we are most proud of. Yang Ahmad Arif Tun Tunku Maimun is our second alumni to be Chief Justice of Malaysia and the first female Chief Justice. Her leadership of the judiciary has been sterling, to say the least, providing significant pathways into constitutionalism and building a judiciary which is progressive and responsive to the needs of the nation. Her ladyship's presence here is to say a few words, uh, to say a few words is most significant to us as we mark our 50 years of existence. It would be very remiss of me not to acknowledge, although I will not be able to name here, the other great judges, academics, lawyers, and civil servants, corporate and political leaders who were our graduates uh, or teachers at our faculty who have over the years contributed to the good of our nation and of mankind. Even today, as panelists of this public lecture, I can mention we have young Saramak Mulia, Datuk Tunku Sofia, Tan Sri Muhammad Arif Yusuf and adjunct professor Philip Ko, who are all former teachers of this faculty and who have contributed greatly to the law and the country. Fourthly, and certainly not least, this momentous lecture is most significant because of the speaker, Professor Dr. Dieter Grimm, a former constitutional jurist and former judge of the Federal Constitutional Court of Germany. The, the large attendance this evening of so many scholars, luminaries, and students of law testifies to the high esteem that our speakers held in. Being a student of constitutional law myself, I cannot overemphasize that our Malaysian constitution, being a written one, has its constitutive power for proper governance embedded in its text, which require interpretation and implementation by the judiciary, citizenry, political actors, and administrators. We hope to be guided by insights from the vast experience of our learned speaker, who has always underscored that for a constitution to be functional, all of us play a vital role to ensure that the text of a constitution like ours goes beyond its material content and must partake various interrelated features. Mm -hmm. Amongst them are, one, the constitution must lay claim to be normatively valid. Two, the constitution must form the basis for the legitimation of political rule. And three, the legal constraints must be comprehensive in the sense that extra constitutional forces may not exercise rule, nor can binding decisions issue from extra constitutional processes. During today's lecture, we await with keen anticipation for our learned speaker to illuminate us further on these and other aspects. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the faculty, I wish to thank all of you for being here today. I acknowledge many of our friends and collaborative partners uh, from universities all over the world who are here today. Thank you for attending. I wish also to thank the Tone Sofian Foundation for celebrating this occasion with us today. The Malaysia Middle Temple Alumni Association, who Tone Sofian was a member of, and uh, the Asia Europe Institute for joining us in this organization of this lecture. I would like to thank also the members of the committee from the law faculty who have worked to bring this public lecture together. I trust that all of you all of you participants yeah, today will continue to take part in our Golden Jubilee celebrations and also all other initiatives that the Faculty of Law, University of Malaya will continue to organize for the development of legal scholarship and the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you, Dean, for your concise and robust uh, address to us. We are encouraged by your commitment and also your citation of Dieter Grimm's commitment to constitutionalism practice. It now results on us, for me, to just ask Yang Amar Arif, the Right Honorable Justice, Chief Justice of Malaysia, Tun Tunku Maimun, to give us his special address. Welcome, uh, Yang Amar Arif. Thank you, Mr. Philip Ko. My sister and brother judges, and Judicial Commissioners, Professor Dr. Rita Grimm, Professor of Law, Humboldt University, Berlin, Tengku Datuk Dr. Hajar Sufia Jiwa, Founder of the Tun Sufian Foundation, 
Tan Sri Muhammad Arif Muhammad Yusuf, trustee of the Tun Sufyan Foundation and former speaker of the Dewan Rakyat, Datuk Associate Professor Dr. Johan Shamsuddin bin Haji Sabarudin, Dean of the Faculty of Law, University of Malaya, respected lecturers, students, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon. It is a great pleasure and honor of mine to deliver this special address on the occasion of the 12th Tun Sufyan Memorial Lecture held in conjunction with the 50-year anniversary of the Faculty of Law, University of Malaya. This occasion is special to me for two reasons. First, the late Tun Sufyan Hashim was a towering figure in law and in life, and not only for his achievements as Lord President. He was instrumental in the drafting of the federal constitution and for the many other legal documents that shape the nation that we have today. It is therefore a humbling experience for me to be here today to deliver this address in fondness of his memory, knowing that I now occupy the very office that he once did. My second reason is that I am a proud alumna of the law faculty and as such, I am very happy to be able to be a part of the celebration of the faculty's golden jubilee. The topic that has been selected for this lecture is an interesting one, and I think befittingly captures the essence of Tun Sufyan, who was an outstanding judge and jurist. Our speaker for the event is none other than Professor Dieter Grimm, a former justice of the Federal Constitutional Court of Germany. Professor Dieter Grimm is an eminent judge and jurist whose works are well renowned. He is most qualified to speak on the topic and accordingly, I shall not attempt to trespass into his domain. Nonetheless, allow me to state my brief opinion on the subject with a view to setting the stage for the lecture that Professor Grimm is about to deliver. In my humble view and to an extent, the role of a judge in constitutional adjudication might seem paradoxical to some. This is because the philosophy behind the notion of judging is that a judge must remain apolitical and free from bias or interference. This remains true to an extent, and in this sense, I echo the following words of Tun Sufyan, who in an essay published in the book on the Constitution of Malaysia said, and I quote, the reputation it enjoys of being able to decide without interference from the executive or the legislature, or indeed from anybody, contributes to confidence on the part of members of the public generally that should they get involved in any dispute with the executive or with each other, they can be sure of a fair and patient hearing and that their disputes will be determined impartially and honestly in accordance with law and justice. Close quote. Indeed, and I have quoted this before, the four things that belong to a judge as described by Socrates are to hear courteously, to answer wisely, to consider soberly, and to decide impartially. And allow me to add the fifth quality as described by former Chief Justice Tun Zaidin Abdullah, which is to discount whatever prejudices, whether they relate to race, religion, or politics. That said, a judge, while he or she must remain apolitical, cannot afford to ignore politics. Therein lies the paradox to the mind that fails to comprehend the difference between politics and political context. The Federal Court of Malaysia affirmed in the Indira Gandhi case that a constitution must be interpreted in light of its historical and philosophical context. And in this regard, judges when interpreting the Federal Constitution of Malaysia are required to appreciate the historical and political context within which that document was drafted. Doing that, in my view, does not make a judge any less apolitical. I now seek to briefly illustrate this. The structure and contents of our constitution contain the concepts of separation of powers and the rule of law, which form part of the basic features of the federal constitution. The other, perhaps primary tenet of the federal constitution is the notion that it is supreme and being supreme, all of us are subject to it, including the three arms of the government, namely the legislature, executive, and judiciary. The legislature makes the law and the executive enforces it. But because in our jurisdiction, the two branches are fused, politics will play a huge part in the laws and the nature of the laws that are passed. 
In this regard, law and politics are inseparable. In a system such as this, the judiciary must remain completely independent and free from any form of interference. Judges will naturally take notice of any political overtones or undertones of a given case, but they must decide cases fairly. This is where Articles 4 and 1 to 1 of the Federal Constitution take center stage. Article 4, Clause 1 declares the Federal Constitution supreme and further states that any law passed after 31st August 1957, which are inconsistent with the Federal Constitution, are void to the extent of the inconsistency. Article 1 to 1, Clause 1, on the other hand, reposes judicial power in the Superior Courts of Malaysia, which means that the judiciary is the device through which the supremacy of the federal constitution is protected. When the two articles are read together harmoniously, there can be no question of judicial supremacy because the executive and the legislature are also creations of the federal constitution and are mandated to act within the terms set out by it. Proper interpretation should reveal that the judiciary is simply required to perform its primary function as the guardian of the federal constitution. This very notion of judicial power was recognized no less by Tun Sufyan himself in the book where he wrote, and I quote, if parliament is not supreme and its laws may be invalidated by the courts, are the courts then supreme? The answer is yes and no. The courts are supreme in some ways, but not in others. They are supreme in the sense that they have the right Indeed, the duty to inval invalidate acts enacted outside parliament's power or acts that are within parliament's power but inconsistent with the constitution. But they are not supreme as regards acts that are within parliament's power and are consistent with the constitution. The court's duty then is quite clear. They must apply the law in those acts without question, irrespective of their private view and prejudice. Close quote. The dilemma rears itself when a breach of a constitutional provision is politically charged or motivated or is strongly steeped in politics. It then, it then becomes a question of whether the judiciary is upholding the law or validating political notions. One example of this is the decision in a case called Merdeka University. That case concerned essentially the validity of the establishment of a university which intended to use the Chinese language as the medium of instruction. The petition to establish that university was rejected and hence the filing of the suit. The government who rejected the petition argued that their actions were justified because the university, if allowed to use the language, would contravene Article 152 of the Federal Constitution, which stipulates that the medium for official purposes shall be in the national language. The High Court agreed with the government and dismissed the suit, and this was upheld on appeal. The interesting point in this case is that Malaysia has allowed, as a matter of practice, the use of other languages as the media of instruction in primary and secondary education. The case was very heavily charged with racial and political sentiments because it concerned the use of a certain language. The erudite judge, Justice Yusofi Abdul Qadir, issued himself with a stern reminder a reminder which all judges faced with similar issues ought to bear in mind. His Lordship said and as follows, and I again quote, the future of the nation is on trial before me, so I am solemnly told in this case in which the plaintiff, Merdeka and Vestiber had six declarations against the defendants, the government of Malaysia, that the rejection of its petition for the establishment of a private university to be known as Merdeka University is null and void in contravening the federal constitution and constituting an unreasonable and improper exercise of the discretion conferred on the young, young Dipertuan Agu. Let me immediately reiterate what I said in court at the outset of the proceedings. I am not concerned with the political undertones or overtones or whatever that may affect the questions raised in this action and in this trial, I am moved by no considerations other than that of determining the issues involved purely and strictly within the confines of the federal constitution and the law, abjuring any concomitant political or emotional offshoots springing like Itina from the head of Zeus in its wake. The Attorney General, meaning well no doubt, presents a vision of doom when he speaks of the grim consequences 
that might ensue if grief circumspection is not exercised in weighing the respective interests involved. But my short answer to this is, as I said in court, in anticipating Mr. Below for the plaintiff, fiat justitia reward calium. Let justice be done, though the heavens should fall. Close quote. In my view, the above passage exemplifies the topic today on how judges ought to approach the various conflicting issues on law and politics. The other aspect of this within the Malaysian context is the debate on the nature of Article 4 of the Federal Constitution and its connection to the Basic Structure Doctrine. The Basic Structure Doctrine, based on earlier cases, was not at first considered but later accepted as a judicial concept that stipulates that the Constitution cannot be amended if it alters or distorts its essential, essential features. Meaning, if, even if the Constitution is amended through correct procedure, the amendment may be struck down as being substantively invalid. That said, the judicial philosophy on this doctrine has recently been divided and it remains to be seen how the issue on basic structure doctrine will be decided in the future. My personal view is in short that the basic structure doctrine is an externally developed doctrine having been conditioned to meet the context of the written constitution in India under specific circumstances. Recent minority judgments, mine included, have expressed that the basic structure doctrine is actually contained conceptually within Article 4, Clause 1 of the Federal Constitution in the form of the doctrine of constitutional supremacy. There is no importation of anything in that sense. In this context, you might wonder why Article 4 and basic structure are relevant to the present discussion. In my view, they are relevant because they clearly illustrate the inherent tension between the legislature and by extension, the executive branch and the judiciary. The inherent tension arises because the legislature having been elected to represent the people is deemed to enact the will of the people. Judges are unelected and are not cloaked with similar privileges as the executives, such as access to intelligence reports and information. To strike down laws can therefore be deemed to contravene the will of the people. The effect of this is all the more jarring when it concerns amendment to fundamental aspects of the federal constitution, the supreme document. There are reams of academic papers, reports, and judicial decisions that have discussed these topics throughout the ages and spanning numerous jurisdictions. Many of these discussions, namely the ones relating to separation of powers and the role played by politics in law and education are also context specific. A current example of this is the unanimous decision of the United Kingdom Supreme Court in Miller or the prorogation case in which the world witnessed the Supreme Court having to grapple with the issue of separation of powers and the role of the courts within the context of the United Kingdom's unwritten constitution. There, the court was mindful of its role and observed thus, and again, I quote, if the issue before the court is justiciable, deciding it will not offend against the separation of powers. As we have just indicated, the court will be performing its proper function under our constitution. Indeed, by ensuring that the government does not use the power of prorogation unlawfully with the effect of preventing parliament from carrying out its proper functions, the court will be giving effect to the separation of powers. Close quote. I respectfully concur with these views. In Malaysia, the overarching effect of Article 4, Clause 1 means that any law which is inconsistent with the federal constitution is to the extent of the inconsistency void. And I do not see why law in this context cannot include constitutional amendments which are unconstitutional. In this connection, one written constitution that attracts my attention is that of the Republic of Germany, which is aptly called the Basic Law. Article 79, Clause 3 of the German Constitution provides as follows. Amendments to the Basic Law affecting the division of the Federation into London, their participation on principle in the legislative process, or the principles laid down in Articles 1 and 20 shall be inadmissible. The German constitution to which I think our Article 4, Clause 1 is similar, 
quite clearly provides that certain fundamental aspects of the constitution cannot be changed. I have attempted to state my views as to why this is the case in Zaidi Kanapia. In short, my understanding is that this is borne out by Germany's history, the world wars, and the fundamental fears that certain aspects of German democracy and way of life should not and cannot be changed. This is also related to Hans Kelsen's pure theory of law. Thus, in my humble view, when judges interpret a constitution, they must also have regard to the political and social context in which it was drafted. Judicial decisions are subject to public confidence in the judiciary, which in turn relates to public acceptance and legitimacy, not just of the decisions, but of legislative and executive conduct. Judges must therefore understand their judicial role and be trusted to carry them out faithfully. The public lecture today is on lessons from a constitutional judge. Having shared my views on the topic, I look forward to hearing our star speaker, Professor Grimm, on this very important area. Given that the learned professor is himself a constitutional judge and seasoned in this field, I am certain that we will all leave this forum richer with knowledge. Before I close, I would like to congratulate the Tun Sufyan Foundation, founded by my own former lecturer, Tunku Datu Sufya Jiwa, working hand in hand with the law faculty, specifically Mr. Philip Koh and team, for their commendable efforts in making the lecture possible. It keeps the name of the late Tun Sufyan alive and is a praiseworthy endeavor to commemorate our beloved faculty's 50th anniversary. Thank you. Honorable Justice, we are humbled again by your winsome and wise and insightful words. You have forwarded our discourse for this afternoon in a manner commensurate to the high office you occupied, which gives us confidence that under your leadership, we, the people of Malaysia, will enjoy much love and commitment to this nation. It now falls on me not to delay the proceedings further because our keynote speaker is what we are here for. And I'm very, very pleased and honored that Professor Dieter Grimm has agreed to give us his special address on this 12th Tun Sophia Memorial Lecture and the golden anniversary of the Uni University of Malaya Law School. Professor Dieter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Philip Coe, uh, dear chairman of the Tun Safian Foundation, Mr. Dato Seri Shekdaut, dear uh, founder of the foundation, Mrs. Tunku Sofia Jua, dear Chief Justice of the Federal Court of Malaysia, Lady Tun Tenku Maimun, and special thanks to you for mentioning Article 79 of the German Constitution with approval, a very important feature of the German Constitution. Constitution, dear Dean of the Law School, uh, Professor Samshudin, honorable members of the uh, Judicial Legal Fraternity, honorable members of the Middle Temple uh, Alumni Association and of the Asia Europe uh, Institute, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first say that for me, it is an immense privilege uh, and honor to address this distinguished uh, audience and to deliver the 12th Tun Sufian uh, lecture. Upon the occasion of the golden jubilee of the Faculty of Law of the University of Malaysia, my best wishes uh, to you, uh, Dean, professors, alumni, for the next 50 years. I'm truly grateful for this opportunity, and I thank you very much for the invitation. I would, of course, have preferred to deliver this lecture uh, in Kuala Lumpur, but uh, in times like these, uh, uh, a virtual event is better than nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, constitutionalism, of course, has a long history. It emerged in the great revolutions uh, of the late 18th century in North America and in France. And it has, has meanwhile established itself universally as a means to organize and to limit and to legitimate uh, public power. 
which of course does not mean that it is already always and everywhere taken seriously. Constitutional adjudication is a much more recent phenomenon. It started in 1803 in the United States, but the United States remained alone for more than 100 years. The first country to follow was Austria, 1920, in, uh, the post, in its post-World War I uh, constitution, drafted by an eminent jurist whom the Chief Justice just mentioned, Hans Kelsen. Uh, and this established a different model of constitutional adjudication, namely compared to the US Supreme Court, uh, that is a general Supreme Court with the power of constitutional adjudication, Austria established a specialized constitutional court. And ever since we have these two types of constitutional adjudication, common law countries prefer a general constitutional court, civil law countries prefer a specialized uh, uh, constitutional court. Your country belongs to the first group, my country, Germany, belongs to the second. But the breakthrough of constitutional adjudication came only after World War II, that's to say in the second half of the 20th century. So in Germany, in its constitution of 1949, but the biggest wave, there were several waves, but the biggest wave certainly was the wave after the seminal changes in the world of 1989 and 1990, when a number of communist system collapsed but also a number of authoritarian uh, regimes, militarist regimes, racist regimes, and dictatorships. By now, constitutional adjudication is considered as an integral part of constitutionalism. Although I think it was mentioned in the introductory statements, we face a certain backlash uh, in countries that fall back into systems of authoritarianism. They do not abolish their constitutional courts, but they curb the powers of their courts and they pack the courts with judges who are loyal to the ruling uh, party. But back to the situation of 1989, 1990. Um, why was it that such a big spread of constitutional adjudication emerged at that time? Uh, I think it was the experience that many of these countries had made, and not only these countries, Germany, of course, my country as well, the experience that they had made that constitutions were of little value without an enforcement mechanism. Why this? I think we have always to bear in mind that constitutions once enacted are just a text obeyed a text that claims legal validity as binding force, but the text does not enforce itself. It depends on being implemented by its addressees. Now, the addressees of constitutional law are, of course, the institutions of the state, in particular, the highest organs of government and the politicians who are active in these institutions. And this is the cause of a specific weakness of constitutional law compared to ordinary law. Ordinary law regulates the behavior of individuals and their associations. And if they, they do not comply with the law, the state enforces the law, if necessary, by using its coercive means. If government institutions violate constitutional law, there is no superior power to enforce it. Uh, addressees, and guarantors of the constitution are identical. And the coercive means remain in the hands of the government. And this is why constitutional law is a more vulnerable uh, law and constitutionalism is an endangered achievement. And constitutional adjudication, of course, be it with general courts or be it with specialized constitutional court was regarded as the, the remedy. What is the difference? Uh, we can see it, I think, if we compare for a moment systems with constitutional adjudication and systems without constitutional adjudication. Uh, although constitutions do not only uh, limit government action, but they also enable it and uh, uh, they legitimate politics, 
politicians very often experience constitutional law in concrete situation primarily as a restraint. And they are tempted to evade the constitutional bonds. The political decision-making process is guided, of course, by political consideration. Is this measure useful for my country or not? Can it be financed? Uh, how will uh, uh, powerful actors and groups in society react to it? How will it affect my chances for the next election? And so on. And only when the political questions are answered, then usually the constitutional question is asked, are we allowed to do what we think we should do? And very often the answer is given in systems without a constitutional thought. The answer is given through the lens of the political plans. That's to say in systems without constitutional education, there is no counterweight against the predominance of political considerations in the political process. In systems with constitutional education, the mere existence of a constitutional court forces politics to pose the constitutional question rather early and in a rather neutral way. In addition, if it is controversial what uh, the constitution requires or prohibits, in a system without constitutional adjudication, the majority always wins. And this can ultimately absorb the function of the constitution, the function to be the common basis of uh, forces that are otherwise opposed and the constitution in the end may lose its pacifying force. In systems with constitutional adjudication, there is a neutral arbiter and the minority, the opposition, can have a chance to win. So constitutions remain just a text, but now through constitutional adjudication, the text becomes teeth, so to say. <clears throat> However, we have to realize that this only reduces the weakness of constitutional law. <clears throat> it does not eliminate this weakness because the fundamental mental situation doesn't change. The coercive means are in the hands of uh, 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 the government. So constitutional courts or general courts with the power of judicial review are in a weaker position. And uh, this is why we have to speak about acceptance of the constitutions at the later stage of my uh, talk. This was the first basic problem of constitutionalism and constitutional education. There is a second one. Very often, in almost all really important uh, cases, the text of the constitution is not very clear. Rather, it is the first experience of judges when it comes, when a case comes to their desk, comes to decide case and controversy but also the same for a legal scholar who reflects on a case or uh, on a problem or a controversy. The meaning of the constitutional provision with regard to the case at hand is not answered by just reading the text of the constitution. The text in many cases, most cases I would say is unclear as uh, ambiguous is open-ended. Of course, this is not only the case uh, with constitutional law, it's a characteristic of uh, law in general. Law differs from a command or an order uh, in that it is meant to apply in a great number of future cases, even cases or problems that were not foreseeable at the time of enactment. The consequence is that law has to be formulated in rather general and abstract terms, whereas cases are always individual and concrete. That's to say there is a gap between the general norm and the concrete facts. And uh, this is common uh, more or less to all law, but for constitutional law, again, it is true in an increased manner. It is true in an increased manner because the constitution contains the highest principles uh, for the political and social order. And the same is true for fundamental rights. The object of protection of the fundamental rights is mostly just one word, press, religion, art, privacy, etc. 
and then these objects are declared free. And then the legislature is authorized to limit this freedom. So almost everything that is important for deciding a case is left uh, open. It's a little bit better with organizational and procedural norms, but this doesn't change the general situation. And the gap between norms and cases is particularly broad in constitutional law. The gap has to be bridged by interpretation. And interpretation means to, to concretize the general and abstract norm with regard to the case at hand. And this concretization only makes the norm applicable to the effects of an individual case. This is sometimes easy, sometimes it's difficult, depending on the degree of open-endedness of the provision, uh, depending also on the, comp the uh, complexity or the novelty uh, of the case. Very often, very long chains of arguments and steps are necessary in order to reach a decision, but of course, steps that have to be always traceable back to the text of the norm. In order to do that in a rational way and in a, a predictable, predictable way, uh, methods of interpretation uh, are necessary. But before I turn to uh, methodology in constitutional law, I would like to briefly discuss uh, a theory about judicial decision making that is particularly prominent in the United States, uh, but finds resonance also elsewhere in, I think, an increasing way. According to this theory, uh, judges are rational actors trying to maximize their profit or the profit of their institution, like business people or political actors do. Hence, this is what the theory says. Uh, when uh, judges decide cases, they do not do what they say they do, namely to apply the law, in our context, the constitutional law, but they follow other criteria, personal preferences, institutional self-interest, political affiliation, or what you like. And only after the decision has been taken, according to these non-legal criteria, they give legal reasons so that the decision looks as if it had been derived from norm. And this is called a realistic view of judicial decision-making. Now, I do not deny that uh, this attitude exists here or there. I do not deny that there are judges who decide in their own interest or have a political agenda or try to avoid conflicts with power holders. What I only want to insist on is that this is not inherent in uh, uh, legal adjudication and constitutional adjudication, but it is the pathological case, the case which betrays the function of judges. And moreover, realists have no superior insight in what is going on when judges uh, decide a case. They only have a theory, uh, namely rational choice theory, which was originally developed to explain economic behavior and was then generalized. But I think it overlooked the relative autonomy of the law, the law is to a large extent a product of political decisions, this is clear, but once enacted, it emancipates itself from the political source and is handled according to legal criteria. And this is corresponding with my personal experience as a judge of which I will talk uh, a few minutes later. When I continue to speak now, I would like to make it clear that I speak of judges who take their function uh, of the application of the law seriously and faithfully to the purpose of the Constitution. But again, this does not change the basic problem that the text, in many cases, does not fully determine the outcome, but rather leaves doubts as to its meaning with regard to individual cases. The means uh, that uh, this means that uh, uh, applying the law, in particular constitutional law, is not to unfold a meaning that is, uh, has been, so to say, deposited in the text of the law from the moment of enactment on, so that it has only to be found, 
Rather, to a bigger or smaller extent, the meaning is construed. Hence, interpretation is only partly a cognitive operation, but partly a volitive or a constructive uh, operation. This has a consequence, and the consequence is that there is usually a margin of interpretation. There are cases where only one uh, solution, one interpretation of a norm seems possible, uh, but uh, these cases are exceptions, especially when we deal with constitutional law. Mostly, there is more than just one possible interpretation of a legal norm vis-a-vis -vis a certain case that has to be decided. Now, what I regard as particularly important is that it is not so that where the clarity of the norm ends, the judge chooses according to his or her personal preferences. In other words, where the determinacy of the text ends, uh, the law becomes political. This is an idea that a legal realist would certainly subscribe, but what, uh, of which I think that it is not the right one. Rather, within the margin that the text leaves, the operation continues to be a legal one, provided that it is done correctly. And there are special legal methods of interpretation that try to help judges in this situation. There is legal doctrine, a shared understanding of the purpose or the function of a norm and a proven a solution for recurring problems, and there are precedents in common law more important uh, than in uh, civil law countries. Of course, neither method, method of interpretation nor doctrine are as authoritatively given as the text. They don't have the same binding force that the law itself has. They are the result of a constant work with the law shared by legal scholars and uh, by legal practitioners. Uh, and usually legal methods and legal doctrines uh, uh, compete uh, with each other. There are more than one. Sometimes methodological disputes are more severe than disputes about the correct solution of one single case. In Germany, the Weimar Republic, first half of the 20th century is a good example where we had a long, important struggle between the formalists and those who followed a more substantive understanding of constitutional law. Today, we have a split uh, in the United States between originalists uh, uh, who uh, mm, uh, require that the text is only understood or interpreted in the way it was understood by the founders or as the words were used in late 18th century. And on the other hand, those who uh, regard constitutions as a living tree and feel authorized to adapt the meaning of the constitutions to new challenges that could not have been known at the time of the adoption. But these are legal disputes about the legal solutions, and they should not be confused with anything goes. Rather, I think that every individual judge has to reach for himself a result of which he or she is convinced that this is the correct understanding of the law. But the judge has to admit at the same time that another judge may come to a different solution without necessarily having made a, a mistake. Maybe, I don't know, maybe the uh, methodological principles uh, that the German Constitute, uh, Constitutional Court follows uh, are of some interest. We don't have much methodological differences now, different from the uh, Weimar period. There are no originalists in Germany. There are no longer formalists in Germany. I, I think I best can describe the methodological approach by three maxims. The first one is the constitution should be understood as a unity. Constitutional norms should not be interpreted isolated. They should be interpreted in relation with other norms and with the constitution as a whole. The second maxim, the court chooses a value-oriented approach, especially for adjudicating fundamental rights. Uh, the court understands fundamental rights as legal expressions of values, 
uh, and uh, uh, it understands organizational and procedural provisions as fulfilling a certain function. Uh, and this gives way to a more substantive understanding of the constitutions. The most important maxim is give the values, the purposes behind a legal a constitutional norm the utmost effect under the given conditions in the moment of adjudication. And this leads to the third maxim, since the conditions, say the factual situation to which the law applies is in constant flux, it may happen that an interpretation that was found in the past no longer serves the purpose or the value of the norm best may even produce dysfunctional results so that an adaptation of the interpretation, a new meaning uh, is necessary uh, in order for constitutions to cope with social change. And this requires an analysis of the facts to which the norm apply. Analysis of facts always a very important part of legal reasoning in Germany. And it gives the whole interpretation a dynamic, a very dynamic feature. Uh, with this in mind, I think we are now better prepared for a discussion of the uh, uh, perpetual question uh, when it comes to uh, constitutional adjudication, namely, is judicial review a political or a legal activity? Are constitutional courts or general courts with the power of constitutional adjudication, uh, legal institutions or political institutions? And this question, of course, is likewise of interest to uh, academics and to uh, uh, the general public. And as far as I uh, can see, the consensus uh, has not uh, been reached. Uh, in the academic world, uh, scholars of uh, political science, empirical discipline, uh, who are not interested in the uh, uh, role uh, we are not interested in, in the, the, the methodological way of finding the right solution, but they are interested in the role of courts in the political system. They tend to understand uh, uh, constitutional adjudication and courts as political activity and institutions, whereas legal scholars, say normative discipline, uh, are mostly interested in the correct interpretation and application of the law, and they consider constitutional courts, constitutional interpretation as legal institutions, at least in uh, Europe. In the United States, it may be a little bit different. Uh, many legal scholars in the US, certainly those who claim to be realists, uh, understand uh, constitutional law, constitutional law application, constitutional courts as uh, political. The question is, of course, of a high relevance. Uh, the Chief Justice mentioned it in her introductory remarks already. If adjudication is a political activity, it's difficult to justify that a small number of unelected and unaccountable judges have the last word in highly political matters. On the other hand, it is well known that without judicial review, the relevance of a constitution is usually small. My impression is that this way of uh, posing uh, the question does not sufficiently differentiate. It is in my view, not an either or question, but I would like to reformulate the question by asking in which respect is constitutional adjudication political and in which respect is it legal? And if the question is posed like this, it is evident that the object of judicial review is inevitably politics. Constitutional courts or Supreme Courts with the constitutional power are established to enforce constitutional law and constitutional law is the law that regulates the establishment and the exercise of political power. So what is reviewed in constitutional courts is acts or omissions the political institutions of the state, and that they do this is not a transgression of their power. This is what we have these courts uh, for. If they would refrain from reviewing political acts, they would betray their function. So the object 
of decision making in uh, these courts is inevitably political. Secondly, the effects of these decisions are likewise political and again inevitably so. If a law is annulled or if an international treaty cannot be ratified by parliament because it would violate the constitution, this has tremendous political consequences. If this is unacceptable for someone, uh, that judges uh, take decisions with tremendous political implications, inaccept or remain the cause of his or her understanding of the democratic principle, then one has to be against constitutional adjudication uh, uh, altogether. Now, if this is so, if the object is inevitably political, and if the effects of judicial review are inevitably political, only one question remains, and this question is whether the activity of adjudicating is also inherently political. And of course, again, an advocate of legal realism wouldn't hesitate to say that adjudication is always politics, because they do not believe, uh, they, or better, they do believe that the law does not matter, uh, and that the courts do not do what they tell us that they do. My own experience in uh, the German Constitutional Court and my logic of, log, uh, knowledge of quite a number of foreign constitutional court tells me that this is not so, at least that is, this is not necessarily so. If judges take their function seriously, if they are loyal to the law, not to a political party or to a ruler or to other power holders, then what they do is a legal activity. There may, of course, be a dispute about the meaning of the law or dispute about the uh, correct method to determine meaning, but these are legal disputes where political considerations and political arguments do not play a role. Let me talk for a moment because my hosts uh, encouraged me to do that. Let me talk for a moment uh, about the practice in the uh, uh, court in which I served for 12 years. 12 years is the term for constitutional judges, different from ordinary judges. Uh, we have a system in the constitutional court uh, of a, a judge rapporteur. So if a case comes, one immediately knows to which judge this case goes. And this is divided according to subject matters. Subject matters are determined for a year in advance so that there can be no manipulation in handing over a case to an individual judge. My uh, responsibility, for instance, was uh, for subject matters like freedom of speech, freedom of media, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, uh, privacy, uh, among some others. So if a case arrives in Germany around 6,000 per year, uh, it is clear who is who will be the judge rapporteur. The task of the judge rapporteur is to prepare the decision by a sort of mem memo for his or her colleagues. And the memo describes the facts, of course, describes the decisions of the lower courts, if there are decisions of the lower courts, gives a resume of ac ac uh, academic writing on the problem, and very often gives also an account on the jurisprudence of foreign courts in similar matters. Uh, and then uh, uh, the judge rapporteur adds a reasoned, or pro a reasoned proposal how to decide, yet not a draft opinion. Uh, and these memos may have some 20 pages in ordinary cases, but may have 200 pages in important cases and uh, in very important cases, it, they may even be very important cases where the court decides after oral argument, uh, the memos may be even uh, uh, longer. Uh, I should, of course, mention that every sitting judge has the full dossier. So uh, the judge rapporteur doesn't have a privileged uh, information. They have all the full dossier. And the memo is then uh, the basis of the deliberation. And the deliberation in an ordinary case may be a half day uh, in... Uh, uh, important cases, it may be uh, several days. And what was particularly interesting for me and helped me to enjoy my term on the Constitutional Court was that in the court, there were no 
factions or groups of like-minded judges who before the deliberation started came together uh, to fix uh, uh, their attitude for the deliberation. This did not uh, exist, that's to say, one always entered into an open uh, discussion. Uh, and there was a general attempt to see whether a consensus could be found. Not at any rate, but if possible, a consensus would was regarded as better than a split vote. And in the deliberations, arguments mattered. Non-legal arguments would have been unaccepted. I'd never heard a non-legal uh, argument. Of course, there can be controversies about what counts as a legal argument, but again, these are legal controversies. It was quite normal that judges change their mind because of the deliberation. And I've even seen if cases, but a few only, where the judge rapporteur asked uh, his or her colleagues to vote against his original proposal because he was convinced by the deliberation that a different solution would be better. I don't want to idealize that. Everybody in a legal collegium, judicial collegium, uh, at some time reaches the end of his or her willingness to continue the debate or reaches the limits uh, of the capacity to follow a debate. Uh, and uh, this ends sometimes up in disappointment. It sometimes ended up in disappointment on my side, but I was quite sure that others in other cases might have been dis disappointed uh, by me. But in general, it was a serious and responsible debate. And I very often compared it to the academic debate in academic uh, uh, settings. And uh, uh, my impression was uh, that it was a more serious debate. Why? Because of the necessity to reach a conclusion that would then be the law of the country, perhaps for many years. The liberation ends with the vote. Many are unanimous, but not all. Then the judge rapporteur drafts the opinion, drafts even if he or she was in the minority. And there is a second deliberation on the draft page by page. And the giant final version is signed by all participating judges, regardless of whether they were a majority or minority in the case of a split vote. Germany is a civil law country where normally the courts speak with one voice. Uh, difference within the court are not disclosed, but the constitutional court is an exception. Dissenting uh, the opinions are allowed in the constitutional court, but they are rare. And I think they are rare because there is a willingness to reach uh, a compromise. And if this compromise is reached, it reduces the inclination uh, to dissent. If in a controversy, every side makes a move uh, and uh, uh, this is, uh, often doesn't make sense to an individual to dissent for the small uh, remaining rest. But of course, there are limits to compromise when it comes to really principled question. All this, uh, I mentioned it also with this in mind, all this is very different from what we know from the United States Supreme Court. And that brings me to the importance of the institutional setting uh, of judicial review, and especially uh, to the procedure uh, of recruiting judges for constitutional courts. In the United States, uh, uh, everybody knows that it's the sole choice of uh, the president of the US, who of course needs uh, the consent of the Senate. But in, if in the Senate, uh, the, uh, his party has the majority, it's usually clear what happens. And this system has led to a strong partisan divide in the US constitutional court, uh, whereas such a divide does not exist in Germany. Even if there is a split vote, it's usually a split vote, not according to party uh, lines. The German system of recruiting judges is different from the US system. In Germany, they are elected by parliament, half by one house, the other half by the other house of parliament. But, and this is more important than the division into two bodies with a two thirds majority. And never has any political party in Germany even come close to a two thirds majority. So always the consent of the opposition uh, is uh, necessary. 
Uh, and this has led to an informal, how should I say, uh, it has led to a system where majority and opposition have informally divided the nomination. Uh, so if a seat becomes vacant, one knows which political party majority or minority may make a move, may mention a name, but then they negotiate seriously. And this has contributed to a real impartial judiciary and uh, uh, has uh, led the attention of politicians who made the, make the decision on the quality of the people who end up in the constitutional court. Uh, this cannot be expected where the appointment is in the hands of a, a political majority uh, alone. However, the structural weakness of constitutional adjudication persists, regardless of which system of recruitment uh, you have. The coercive means that remain in the hands of government. Constitutional courts may oblige government to omit certain actions or may oblige them to take certain actions, but they cannot force government to do it. If government does not comply, the court can just wait for the next case to come and reaffirm its judgment. But this is to no avail if the government continues to resist. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning that uh, courts increasingly face uh, such a situation also in member states of the European Union, even in countries that 30 years ago took pride in establishing a judicial review. Uh, and uh, this shows uh, that courts more than institutions that dispose of coercive means depend on acceptance. Acceptance first by the addressees of the constitutional norms, that's to say the politicians. It means that constitutional adjudication depends on a large extent on that politicians have in internalized, internalized that they are bound by constitutional law. And that institutions which are authorized to determine the meaning and enforce the constitution ought to be obeyed. In Germany, this was up to now the case. Uh, I know of many cases that heavily frustrated political ambitions uh, and were heavily criticized, but of, I don't know of any case where uh, the politicians finally refused to obey uh, the constitution. But since they are always tempted to use their superior power, I think there is still another acceptance necessary, and this is the acceptance of uh, the judiciary and especially of constitutional courts and courts with constitutional adjudication, namely the uh, acceptance in society, so that it becomes too costly for politicians to disregard constitutional courts rulings because this may uh, entail a delegitimization of politicians. Is it, e it is easy to see that internalization of uh, constitutionalism, acceptance of constitutionalism are not a legal resource. They are cultural resources. And it's a cultural resources that ultimately decide about the success or the failure of constitutional adjudication. With this, I think uh, uh, I end and uh, I thank you for your attention. Professor Dieter, this, even, this afternoon in Malaysian time, you have given us traversing so many disciplines and in your insight of constitutional adjudication and judicial decision-making and in the concrete examples you gave in your journey in constitutional court has provided us a map and a compass and many thoughts to reflect upon. The nature of a formal lecture like this, we would not be able to entertain direct questions from the floor nor from the online, but I would like to encourage uh, anyone to make observations on the chat box of which we would make a recording and if time permits, 
we would convey the same to professor and he could make some concluding comments, not immediately, subsequently uh, in his leisure. Professor Dieter, we are thankful for your sharing your experience, both as jurist, as judge, and now as a renowned public intellectual in these disciplines you have exposed us to. In place of a Q&A, we have today with us Arif Yusuf, a notable academic of the University of Malaya alumnus who proceeded to have a very, very active private practice and also Court of Appeal judge and speaker. He has written two major books. One, we have called it the Erskine May of Malaysia, Parliamentary Practice, and a forthcoming one that is his personal reflection almost for 23 months as a speaker of Parliament Unexpected. We very much welcome him this afternoon in place of a Q&A to pose some relevant questions to us all and also to share his experience as a constitutionalist adjudicator at the Court of Appeal and in his writings. I'm very happy to hand over the microphone to Arif Yusuf. Thank you, Professor Philip, uh, for that short introduction. Uh, the uh, Right Honourable Chief Justice of Federal Court of Malaysia, Tun uh, Tengku Maimun, Yang Mulia Tengku Sofia, representing the trustees of the Tun Sofian Foundation, uh, Professor Edita Grimm, um, cut it short, ladies and gentlemen, honorable ladies and gentlemen who are present today uh, via this Zoom platform. Listening to Professor Dieter's lecture just now, I'll, I'll just summarize it in one word. Yeah. Fascinating. For someone trained in the uh, common law tradition, which basically means the English common law tradition, I have listened to such a fascinating account of constitutionalism set in its proper context, right from the juristic basis to your explanation of how the constitutional court, at least in Germany, works, right down to the weaknesses even um, in your constitutional court system. Um, so altogether, I think there are lessons to be learned today from this very valuable lecture. And uh, it is my humble privilege uh, to be a discussant today, to explore and perhaps to probe and ask a few questions uh, to Professor Ditter, so that perhaps those questions and when, when replied um, can be of greater assistance to us in Malaysia. Now, Professor Ditter, I understand, um, is no stranger to Asia. I think he told us he has been to China and Korea, but he has never been to Southeast Asia. Um, so now is a good occasion, Professor Ditter, for, 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 for you as an esteemed jurist to be familiar with our system. And uh, of course, I am personally it is very fascinated with some of the points you have made. For instance, you have said there are no originalists in Germany and there are no formalists in Germany. Uh, that comes as a shock to me because in Malaysia, we have formalists aplenty. You know, so maybe let, let me uh, just give you a kind of um, um, a feel of. Uh, Malaysian uh, legal fraternity and Malaysian jurisprudence, constitutional jurisprudence in particular. Now, as, as Malaysians, we are more comfortable with the common law tradition, as I said just now, the English legal tradition, and with it will come the thought processes and the lines of jurisprudence that underline the common law. So it is good that Professor Data has explored so, so many juristic issues so that we are lifted you know, away from our comfort zone. Um, 
I have done this um, screenshot to, to start uh, the discussion or my response. I would like to refer to the case of Debin Mustafa. Uh, I won't give you the full citation. Uh, I just want to look at the principle of the for contemplation. And in this, I'm thankful to um, my lady, uh, Chief Justice, for already highlighting many of the issues which I want to highlight today in, in my response to Professor Dita. In Tebin Mustafa, judges are cautioned against entering into the realm of judicial activism or legislating. The two are, seem to be equated to me. And it is never the duty of the courts of law, according to the decision in David Mustafa, to engage in uh, judicial activism or, or legislating. Uh, I, I think if we look at the problem uh, more deeply, this is classic dicey, uh, classic common law tradition that judges uh, are meant merely to apply the law as passed by parliament. Whatever parliament has decided, judges by and large have to apply the law. Uh, there is no accepted cultural acceptance, maybe in a larger sense, uh, amongst the judiciary, that you can inquire into the value of the law. Uh, you have mentioned it in your lecture just now. The German system, the continental system, uh, is based on a value assessment as well, aside from formalism. But in Malaysia, because of the influence of the common law tradition, quite often we face this problem. Judges have to only apply the law. They cannot look at the justice of the law the fairness of the law. And that will give us a lot of problems sometimes. Yeah. We have, of course, uh, methodologies, which you have also mentioned in, in your lecture, uh, rules of interpretation, they are well and good. But I, I think where we are missing is the analysis of how do we approach questions in constitutional law. How do we approach issues in constitutional law? How are constitutional uh, cases to be decided by our judges, right? Now, we have at the moment a number of um, decisions. This is something which has occurred only very lately, uh, wherein the certain, certain fundamentals of uh, a unique constitution and education have come to the fore. Uh, my lady Chief Justice has mentioned it on how judges should be interpreting the constitution holistically you know, in context uh, and so on. But of course, we have the two extremes. One extreme would uh, refer to formalism and the other would give us, you know, invite us to look at it in a more, more general you know, review, sort of. Um, so my question to you is, given your experience as a constitutional judge, how do we balance this? Um, I noticed that you, you are also you know, trained in the uh, Anglo-American system, having taught in uh, Harvard and Yale. So it, it will help, I think, us to know or to be given some pointers on how can we balance uh, the extreme pools of uh, formalism, which seems to rear its head in Malaysia quite often, and judicial activism or judicial liberalism. Um, how how would we? How are we supposed to look at this problem you know, in, 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 in in a proper setting? Of course, I've done personally constitutional cases too. Some of which have been very controversial. <laughs> Uh, I can think of one case that I did involving um, the uh, Peaceful Assembly Act, where we had a panel of three and we came to a unanimous decision that we can look at the reasonableness of the law. Putting very simply in that case, the three of us decided the law enacted by parliament, which insisted that uh, whoever wanted to 
demonstrate, basically, must give notice, 10 days notice to the police before they could legislate, before they could organize a demonstration or peaceful assembly. Yeah? Um, we thought this was unconstitutional because it put a fetter on the freedom of assembly and uh, association. So the law was struck down as unconstitutional. Uh, we took that bull step. That didn't actually come down well amongst many, including judges internally and politicians, of course, uh, and parliamentarians. No one would like to say you have not done it right. But anyway, we decided uh, it as such using both methodology, interpretation, not politics. I think you have got the point there earlier. You know? um, when the case comes for adjudication, political considerations do not apply. So I think in that case, we were not motivated by political considerations. We were motivated more on the issue of constitutionality, on the issue of whether the value in that particular law was reasonable, or whether we should not strike it down. We struck it down. Of course, subsequently, there was another court, same court of appeal, which came to a different decision. So, so until today, we have two court of appeals giving completely different decisions. But that is not my point. My point about the uh, Professor Jitter, just for your contemplation and for you know, a response from you in, in uh, the more global context. After that, I became the Speaker of Parliament. And uh, you know what happened? The government amended that law. That particular provision was amended and the government um, shortened the period from 10 days to five days. And no one better than I live. You know, I think the lesson here is, even in Malaysia, if the judicial function is performed well, according to the lines of argument that we are so accustomed to, uh, not from formalism as such, but you know, you, you interpret the constitution as the constitution should be interpreted, interpreted you assess uh, on the basis of some value judgment against the wording of the constitution, there will be acceptance. And I think this case proves it. The, the, political, uh, the politicians accepted that there was a problem. They took it back to parliament. Parliament amended the law. And there the matter rested. I think people are quite happy with what has happened. Uh, um, so of course, I think this is an isolated incident, uh, I think. Um, but I must also say, I was presiding in the house when the amendment came, came up, you know, and um, I was asked by the parliamentarians uh, not to recuse, no. They were asking my opinion on this amendment to the law, uh, to which I said, I can't give you my opinion because as a speaker, I cannot take sides. But it proves the point, actually. Eh? we can actually do away with formalism yeah, uh, and, and look at our constitution in the way that uh, Professor Ditter has suggested, yeah? understand the concept of constitutionalism properly and understand the constitu constitutionalism as I think Professor Ditter, you have said in your book, I've gone through the book you know, in quite de in, in a de detailed way, you have mentioned in essence, constitutionalism is the submission of politics to law. I think that contains you know, a, a, a gem of a truth as far as lawyers are concerned. And those who are interested in constitutional law and have to decide constitutional cases must, must have that imprinted you know, in, in their minds. Not so much dicey. Dicey is uh, you know, out of fashion. <laughs> uh, but, but of course, you know, the long shadow of dicey still lives in Malaysia. I mean, this is the unfortunate thing. But if we take Professor Dieter's analysis, that will do us a lot of good. Constitutionalism is a submission of politics to law. And when legal cases come before the courts, political considerations no longer apply. 
what applies will be legal questions. I think here, I think we have to be thankful to Professor Dieter for putting it so succinctly and uh, so clearly and so much relevant to what we're facing right now. All these issues that we have at the moment on formalism, on whether we can question parliament, whether parliament can house the jurisdiction of the courts, how do we read Article 4, Clause 1 against Article 1 to 1 of the federal constitution can very easily be analyzed. And we come to a clearly acceptable legal solution to a political issue. I, I quite agree with Pro Professor Dieter, who said just now that, that in a judicial review, really nearly will come face to face with political issues. If they're not political issues, they don't come for judicial review. But once the political issues that, uh, or the facts in the sense of the case come before the court, the court is expected to apply legal methodology, legal method to resolve a political issue in a legal way. I don't think you know, judges uh, in Malaysia take it upon themselves to decide based on political considerations. No. But where we have got it wrong, I, I feel, um, is to be too formalistic and not analyze the issue further, a stage further, a stage deeper. And this is why I personally have uh, uh, listened very intently to what Professor Dieter has, has said. And uh, you have given us not only a static analysis of constitutional education, but a dynamic one. You have given a philosophical analysis of what constitutional edu education should really mean. And I think for that, we have to be thankful to Professor Tita. Uh, I think in Malaysia at the moment, we are still struggling you know, to, to find some clear philosophical basis for constitutional education. This is where we have this current problem. Minority opinions, majority opinions, whether the basic structure doctrine should apply, whether it should not, whether it's foreign, whether it comes from a Germanic tradition, or, and so on and so forth. Um, but if we have a philosophy uh, that is all embracing, you can forget about Dicey, it's old fashioned. Uh, we have to think out of the box, try and understand uh, what constitutional education is all about. And I think uh, in Malaysia, we'll be on a stronger footing um, to strengthen constitutionalism. You know, constitutionalism as a word has been spoken of throughout the years in Malaysia. There must be hundreds of cases referring to the term constitutionalism. You, know, you, you need to only click on MLG and it comes out a host of cases on the word constitutionalism. But do we understand what constitutionalism is? Professor Dieter understands. He puts it so succinctly. Um, so these are you know, some of the questions I want to pose to Professor Dieter to, to give us some pointers, right? But, but before that, maybe can I have some screenshots just to put it in context? Um, I know it's some of uh, the points have already been mentioned. Let's scroll through the, the screenshots that I have. The second one. Yeah, yes. Oh, okay. Hey, man. Raymond, could you please move the PowerPoints? This is just to set uh, the scene for, for, for Professor Dieter's response. Um, okay, we have done that. Can I have the second one? Alma Nundo Atenza. Here we have very strong statements uh, made, made by, by the federal court again. Separation of powers to be taken for granted as a constitutional fundamental. It is the hallmark of a modern democratic state. It's good. Next one, please. Rovin Jyoti, 2020. Again, very strong. Courts have the task to ascertain constitutionality or legislation. 
and must conform to the most basic precepts of separation of powers and rule of law. Any attempt to suggest judicial usurpation or legislative power and the franchise of the people is misplaced. It's good, except that it comes from a minority judgment. <laughs> Thanks, one. They want undangan negeri Sarawak. I'm thankful to my lady, uh, Chief Justice of Malaysia for this, because this is uh, from her judgment. It comes out very strongly. The Chief Justice has said, I am guided by the doctrine of constitutionalism limited government and the rule of law. The executive and legislative arms of government and their powers are strictly circumscribed, circumscribed by law. Only the courts may have inherent power with a view of doing complete justice and with a view of protecting its process from abuse. Zaidi Kanapia, which again, the Chief Justice has mentioned, 2021. You will notice that Professor Dieter, these are all very recent cases. Um, in the 60s and 70s, um, we were very formalistic. So judicial review was still uh, at its infancy. Very few cases were struck down. Uh, uh, the judges were not speaking you know, in the same terms as uh, they do now. So in Zaidi Kanafia, uh, Chief Justice has said, um, I am of the view that the reading of the word law in Article 4, Clause 1, as being the same as federal law in Article 159, Clause 1, is untenable. 151, 159, Clause 1 is, of course, the amendment power in our constitution. Article 159, Clause 1 allows Parliament to pass law, having met the requisite numbers and other conditions to amend the federal constitution. Article 4, Clause 1, on the other hand, confers supreme status to the federal constitution and prevents all laws that are inconsistent with it from being enacted to the extent of rendering them void. In this sense, federal law, even law to the extent that it seeks to amend the federal constitution, is caught by the pervading reach of Article 4, Clause 1, the fundamental provision. Again, in Zaidi Kanafia, we have uh, a further statement. Article 4, Clause 1 has two limbs to it, conjoined by the word and. The first part of it declares that the federal constitution is supreme. It does not say that any particular provision of it is supreme. Rather, this constitution is the supreme law of the federation. This part is not merely a feeble declaration if we consider Kelsen's postulated theory of good norm. Again, the Chief Justice has mentioned it just now, but I thought I'll just expand it further. Um, so the good norm, according to some judges at least, is still very much alive in Malaysia. But others have taken a different view. Others have said it doesn't exist. It cannot exist in Malaysia because it's not expressly provided for. Um, again, here is a good statement in Zaidi Kanapia. Um, the importation of that, that uh, the consideration of the GUNOM and basic structure doctrine uh, does not mean that any doctrine, certainly not an imported foreign doctrine, was or is more supreme than the federal constitution. What it merely means is that the federal constitution's drafters had in mind certain basic principles which ought to form the bedrock of this country. And then under Article 159, Clause 1, Parliament may amend certain provisions of it without amending the central tenets of this constitution. This is the safeguard as couched in the white language of the first limb of Article 4, Clause 1, to cast away any attempt to cause the federal constitution to implode on itself by abuse of the legislative process. Viewed from this lens, our Article 4, Clause 1 encapsulates substantially the same principle contained within Article 79 of the Constitution of Germany. Um, so, Professor Dieter, um, there have been occasions when our courts have referred to not, not only Hans Kelsen, but also Schmidt, and of course, uh, Article 79 of the German Constitution. And the Grun norm has been referred to, at least by uh, my lady uh, Chief Justice, as the first constitution um, in the constitution context of Malaysia. And I think this statement also is very useful. Um, it fits within your philosophy, uh, Professor Jitta, to look at the context and the foundation of the constitution. This is what Chief Justice said. In the Malaysian context, it ought to be understood that the federal constitution itself is itself a political document arising from the most significant of political negotiations, giving life to the Federation of Malaya and later Malaysia. Unlike the Indian constitution, which was drafted and passed by the Constituent Assembly, 
Our federal constitution is not a document devised by selected representatives, but one negotiated for us by our founding fathers with the colonial power at that time. Changing the basic features of the federal constitution would result in a change of the grun norm or the first constitution of this country, and thus effectively eliminate the very foundation of Malaysia itself. That, in essence, is the thrust of the BSD, Basic Structure Doctrine. Personally, I think this is a, a splendid uh, analysis of what the Malaysian constitution should be, how it should be read, how it should be interpreted. But alas, as of now, this is a minority opinion. So we are therefore very thankful to you. I am personally very thankful to you, Professor Dita, for exploring this matter um, on a wider scale um, and to explore or, or rather to suggest to us that we should not only look at words in the constitution, but look at words in context, with meaning, because, could you just now, the text does not enforce itself. Again, a gem of a statement. Constitutional text does not enforce itself. We humans have to give it meaning. Judges have to give it, to give it meaning. And you can never give it meaning if the juris, jurisprudence is formalistic. If you fall back to dicey, you can never give it meaning. If you fall back to the notion that whatever parliament decides is the law, that we have to defer to the wisdom of the legislature, it will not solve the problem. I think this is perhaps a response from you. Wisdom of the legislature. I, I keep off, uh, quite often I ask myself, and I question my friends too, what do you mean by wisdom of the legislature? Yeah? yeah, sitting at the head of the house uh, for two years almost, I have not only seen wisdom of the legislature, I have also seen instances of unwisdom of the legislature. So the question to be posed to judges and to lawyers and those who are concerned with constitutionalism is simply this. What do you do in the face of unwisdom of the legislature. What do you do when that unwisdom of the legislature translates itself to a complete defiance of human rights? A defiance of basic precepts of the constitution, a defiance of separation of power, of the rule of law. What if? Do you still defer to the wisdom of the legislature. Maybe yeah, we invite a response from Professor Dita because I'm here merely as a discussion. Um, uh, otherwise, I'll be delivering a formal lecture. Uh, but but uh, if you allow me, Professor Philip, because I must say a few nice words to at the end of, of my session uh, to the Faculty of Law. Now, first of all, thank you, of course, to everyone for, for your patience in hearing my response to Professor Dieter's lecture. Um, offer my apologies if I have taxed your collective patience or exceeded my boundary as a mere discussion. Um, but I offer an apologies uh, if I have portrayed the law faculty in the Museum layer in exuberant terms. Um, I congratulate the, the law faculty in the Museum layer for being a co-host to this event on their 50th anniversary. Um, so I will always compliment the law faculty University of Blair. I must confess I'm biased uh, towards the faculty since my legal career started in the law faculty University of Blair in 1974. Um, I wish you all all the best, particularly uh, the constitutional law teachers uh, who will be in listening intently yeah, to, to, to the proceedings today. Um, University of Malaya has had a very sterling um, achievement 
in the area of constitutional law. Many publications uh, emanated from the law faculty, University of Malaya. Uh, but um, I hope with the lecture today by Professor Dita, it will propel the law faculty to greater heights and to do a lot more incisive and uh, uh, more comprehensive uh, analysis of constitutional law jurisprudence. Um, but I'm sure they're already at it. Yeah. Uh, knowing University of Malaya, they're already at it. But of course, please include Professor Dieter's books as compulsory reading. I think it is a must. Yeah. Um, so with that, uh, I have done my bit as discussion. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Professor uh, Dieter, I invite you to give a response. Before that, a, a very brief remark. Thank you very much, Tan Sri Arif Yusuf, uh, trustee of the Tudun Sufin Foundation. It must have been an inspiring moment for me to invite him to be a discussant because he could give both the conspectors of his journey as an academician, practitioner, court of appeal, and then without embarrassment, quote my ladyship dissenting judgments as a beacon of light towards what constitutionalism can mean. Make no bones about it, there is severe contestation still going on as to what the nature and scope of basic features are, what the nature of scope of interpretive methodologies, and as Arif had so ably pointed out to us, these issues are all pervasive. And it is our role, both not just as judicial and legal actors, but the political actors we would appeal to. In the common law tradition, we have the issue of justiciability and conventions, which is the entrance as to how political actors ought to gain and receive acceptance as to judicial determination. I now refer the closing moments over back to Professor Dieter uh, to have some closing remarks as we come to the close of this event. Professor Dieter, your offer. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you raised a number of, of very important questions. And if, I, if my watch is correct, we have just two minutes uh, for a reply. So uh, I will be very brief and just pick up uh, the question of uh, uh, judicial activism versus judicial deferentialism. Uh, if I imagine a spectrum uh, between activism and deferentialism, I would say that the German court is certainly on the side of activism. Uh, uh, it's certainly not at the ultimate end of activism, but it's certainly on the side of activism. About your country, I don't know. I know a little bit of India, and I would say India, the Indian Supreme Court is also on the side of activism, certainly more than on the side of deferentialism. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the fact uh, that uh, the German court is quite active, and this is accepted uh, by the society, the court always gets very high, in the Indian polls, an extremely high uh, amount of support. I think one of the explanations is uh, the German past, the Nazi regime, Hitler. At that time, in the Weimar Republic, we had a formalist approach to the constitution. Democracy meant just majority principle. Constitution was just, it needs a higher uh, vote to amend it than ordinary law. Fundamental rights just meant that you need a law in order to limit them, but uh, the content of the law doesn't matter. All uh, this formal approach was unable to defend the constitution against its enemies and this has discredited formalism in Germany for a long time lasting until uh, uh, until now. So uh, on the other hand uh, the German court is far uh, from uh, uh, trying to overstep the lim limit between judiciary and legislation. So it tries to be faithful to the purpose of the law or a constitutional provision. This is determined by the constitution maker or the lawmaker. It is faithful to the text, but in constitutions, the text is often very open-ended. But it allows itself 
to adapt the meaning of the constitution if the purpose can no longer be reached when you stick to the old first interpretation. This is what uh, the German activism is uh, about. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm very tempted uh, to comment now on questions of uh, proportionality and balancing that you raised also, but we don't have the time. Uh, so I, I just, I think I conclude, I conclude with one uh, point referring to what you said toward the end of your comments. And what do we do about uh, uh, a legislature that is led by unwisdom and not wisdom? And of course that happens and not only uh, uh, maybe in your country, but it certainly happens in my country. But I think that there is a fine line, not easily to define, but a fine line between unwisdom and unconstitutionality. Uh, and we should always try to keep on the side of constitutional law and not overstep is not assume the role of the legislature because this would certainly hurt the democratic substance of a country. Uh, I guess that in this point we will agree, uh, but uh, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Philip already mentioned, if there are questions uh, that are addressed to me by way of writing, uh, I will be most happy uh, to try to answer them. And maybe we also could enter into a conversation about these remarks that you made and that were very important. Thank you, Professor Dieter Grimm. You have been a most honorable and delightful speaker for us. You have journey alongside this afternoon discourse together with the Right Honourable Lady Justice, Chief Justice Tunku Maimun with us, the Dean, and of course, Tunku Sophia. And because of your presence gracing us this afternoon, we have had a journey of both hearts, minds, and now we hope the will to do what is right. As the interpretive horizons beckon us to look at the text, to embody in judgments, in actions, in our activities. We hope that the journey you have also been a catalyst this afternoon to us in memory of a great jurist and judge, Tun Sofian, and also to commemorate the golden jubilee of our beloved faculty led by Dean Johan. We thank everyone this afternoon for being with us, especially your lady and the senior judiciary and judicial legal uh, service members of all rank and file that has tuned in to listen. We also hope that the Attorney General Office, the first legal office of our government and the advisor to the executive would also be able to audit these sessions subsequently. And we hope to bring the content and substance of what is shared. And we, we want to especially uh, thank Arif for taking the trouble to interact with Professor Dieter. Thank you, everybody. And we pray that God Almighty will give us the strength, the energy, and the wisdom to carry on the work that is given to us in our lives. Thank you so much, and a very good evening to you. And a good afternoon and the rest of the day, Professor Dieter. Thank you. Thank you. Good night for Malaysia and a good day to, to the European audience and the Germany. Thank you. Thank you.